Good morning. Now, it's good to see this good number here this morning. We certainly appreciate uh, you coming and, and being with us today. I just want to remind you of this is going to be a, a very busy week for us here, as it should be in, in any church this time of the year of, of Easter. But I uh, just want to remind you, come back. We'll be here tonight at 6 o'clock. I talked about after Nehemiah built the wall, he thought it was successful. It didn't mean the devil was going to stop coming after him. Last Sunday I preached on how, where do we go from here. Tonight I'm going to preach on be careful to don't let your guard down. Don't let your guard down with Satan. So that's what I'll be preaching on tonight from Nehemiah. We invite you to come for that. <coughs> Excuse me. And then also just to remind you of what, what's going to happen next week. Of course, Wednesday night we'll have our uh, Bible study and prayer group and do our regular Wednesday night service. And then Friday, we will have what we call our Good Friday service. That will be at 6 o'clock. And, uh, of course, I will preach and we'll have special singing and we'll participate in the Lord's Supper. But let me tell you about this special, this, this that Friday night, Brother Lynn, how many sermons you think we've got? Thousands of sermons probably somewhere that we've preached over the years. Friday night, I'm going to preach my favorite sermon that I've ever preached for me in my life, Friday night. Forty-four years of preaching. Friday night, I'll preach to you my favorite sermon of all of them. Friday night. Saturday, the Easter egg hunt for the kids. Uh, here at the church at 2 o'clock. And then, of course, remember, next Sunday is Easter Sunday. And we'll start with an Easter sunrise service at 7.30, weather permitting, outside. Now, they call in for like a 67-cent chance of rain. If it does, we'll move it in here. But we're planning on doing it outside. And then following that will be breakfast at 8 o'clock, Sunday school at 
and then our Easter worship service <coughs> at 1030. And that's the schedule uh, for this week. A lot of things going on. Um, also, uh, Miss Colleen wants to meet with all the ladies of the WMU circle right after service this morning in the ladies' Sunday school room over here. I also want to tell you that our, our Annie Armstrong uh, Easter offering is over $4,000 now. Um, had a go through. We, all, we like a little bit of being uh, over 4500 Heading on up to that 5000 mark up there. We hope within the next week or two that we'll get over that. So I'm asking you, encouraging you to help to get the Word of God out because I'll be honest with you, I think the time of getting it out is running short and we need to be doing the best we can for it. So keep that in mind. Thank you for what you've given and uh, helping us reach the goal, but now asking you to help us to go beyond the goal. Norma? Anyone else have anything? All right, if not, the Mimi's going to come. We're going to begin our worship. We're going to uh, sing while we come today to worship God. Mimi will come and lead us. You stand with us as we sing. We have come into his house. <laughs> come in with today to worship the Lord. All right. Children, I don't see many here this morning, but we got children. Y'all come down here for a minute. I want to tell you a little story. Y'all come on down. There you go. Come on down. Hey. There you go. Grayson, how you doing, man? You doing all right? All right. How y'all doing this morning? Good. good. Everybody good? Good. I started a few weeks ago. There he is. Thank you, buddy. Appreciate that. I uh, tell you about a man named Abraham that God called to leave home and go somewhere, and he didn't know where he was going. God said, just follow him. So he followed him for years, looking for a place. And I tell you, last Sunday he found a a place with green grass and a nice place to live and stay. And so he put up camp there, brought all of his animals, his family, and all there with him. But what happens after you've gone several years and you've took your sheep and your goats and your animals there with you, well, over that period of time, they have little ones, don't they? And so the, the herd increases. 
you have a lot of goats, a lot more than you had when you started. And so when they get there, they begin to, to look at the land, they begin to look at the herds that they had, and as they looked out, he had carried his nephew with him. When he left home, he carried his nephew. His name was Lot. And he took him with him to the journey. Well, Lot had his own sheep and goats and cows. Abraham had his. So when they got to this land, there was a problem. Who's going to stay where? Which part of the land you go get? What part does he go get? And so what happens, it be, they all kind of stay in the same place and it becomes so crowded to guess what happens. The men that are watching the herd start fighting with one another. Things turn bad because they all were wanting the same spot. Well, Abraham heard what was going on, so he comes down there and he sees them. And he brings his nephew Lot with him. And this is what he tells him. God has given us more land and stuff and we know what to do with it. So there's no need fighting and arguing over who's going to get this patch or who's going to get that patch. And he does something that a lot of people won't do. He looks at his nephew. Now which one do you think really had the right to choose. Abraham did. Right. Because he's the one that God told to go out there. But you know, sometimes when you love other people, you kind of step back and you look at the situation, and Abraham does, and he goes to his nephew Lot, and he says, there's no need to fuss and fight. People will fuss and fight over anything. It don't take much. And so he looks at him and he says, Lot, there's no need for us to sit here and argue our, our herdsmen to fight with one another and all that stuff. So this is what he says to him. He said, you look up on those mountains, you look down out there, there's the ocean out there, there's the pastures. We've got more land here than we know what to do with. So what does he say? You pick out what you want. You get first choice. Amen. That's right. Exactly. That is very good. He did. That's what this is all about. This is leading up to baby Jesus right here. And so he says, this is what I want you to do. I'll let you be lied. Okay? That's a bad look. I'm fixing to give, I'm fixing to give you anything you want. I'm going to say to you, lie. You choose out of all of that. You choose what you want. He don't let you do what? See that? We got an argument right here. I'm talking about not arguing. We got one right here. <laughs> Proof is in the pudding here. But anyway, he says, Lot, you take. You, I, I, you know, I'll let you have the choice. You pick it. I'll take what's left. How many people do that? Not many. Not many. So Lot looks out and he says, I like these flatlands here. I like, man, there's more grass and pasture out here. And not only that, right out there is the Mediterranean Sea. I got pasture land. I got the beach. I got everything you want. So I think I'm going to take that. And Abraham says, okay. So Abraham packs his family up, all of his animals up, and he leaves Lot and he goes up into the mountains, into the hills. And he takes his family and he moves them up there. So instead of having a big argument, a big fight, when God's given them so much, there's enough for both of them, they learn to love one another. That right. Jesus, and you know, I taught a Sunday school lesson today. You know what Jesus said in it? You love them like I loved you. That's what he said. This is an example of loving other people. 
It's much better to love and to give a little bit than it is to fuss and fight, ain't it? Sure it is. Anybody can fuss and fight. That's easy. But forgiving and getting along with other people sometimes when really it's not easy, but they did it. And that's what God wants us to do. He said, you love them like I love them. So uh, Abraham showed that with his nephew because he loved him and gave him that stuff. Okay, God loves you. Jesus loves you, right? All right, let's pray. Father, I thank you, God, that you love us, and God, you give us more than we deserve, just like you did Abraham and them. You gave abundantly and above more than they ever dreamed of. God, you blessed them like they never thought. And yet, God, they loved you. They moved on, and even though they went their separate ways, they still love one another. God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for sending Jesus, as was said here this morning, to us. And God, as we come to this Easter season, thank you for sending your Son to die for us. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All righty. Hey, who changed my bucket out here? Michael, do you do that? Oh, okay. I'll accept that then. I'll accept that. I, I figured he'd done it. He'd been warning me to go do it. Let me tell you about this little fellow here. He went down to Charleston this week. You know, old Lane's had a tough year last year. But he went down to Charleston. Tiffany, you straight man, if I ain't right. But every test result he got was good, wasn't it? Amen. Every test result he got was good. <laughs> He'd been on our prayer list and prayed for him, buddy. I'm glad you feel him better. Ain't you? <laughs> I can't get, all right, y'all y'all go with Ashley. <laughs> all right. Oh, I'm sorry, baby, I didn't know you was over there. Here you go. There you go. Anyone else want one? All righty. I want to share with you just a little mission story here before we pray and um, might encourage you to to give a little bit more that we might increase this. If ever in the world people need to know God, it's the world we live in today. I'm telling you, it's terrible. Everything's falling away from God, so we need to do all we can do because I believe time is limited. It says Cody and Kristen Chester have planted a church down in South Brevard, Florida, down in uh, Palm Bay, Florida. As part of the vision of the First Baptist Church of Melbourne, Florida, they wanted to plant 10 churches in 10 years. During the first few weeks after the church launched, on Easter 2022, exactly a year ago this Easter, six people came to faith in Christ. Others were already interested in getting baptized. And Cody says that part of the reason the church saw immediate growth is that South Bavard care team brought into the vision completely and showed great compassion to everyone in the ministry. Despite the early ministry fruit, Cody knows that tough days will lie ahead in the life of the church. But he and his team are confident that the Lord will sustain them and their ministry in the Palm Bay area. So vision of 10 churches in 10 years, that's quite a vision. This is one of the first ones they did, and it's God's blessing. So we, these are folks that get to do this because we support them and help them carry the word. We can't go to Florida and preach. 
but we can sure help those that do. So let me encourage you to, to uh, uh, keep that in mind as you give. We're going to have our offertory prayer now, and then maybe he's going to come and, and lead us, and we'll take up our offering this morning. God, I thank you for this day. This is Lord Palm Sunday. God, this is the first day of the Easter week. And God, I pray that as we sing, as we preach, God, uh, that Lord, you will take the message and God help us to realize what a great day it was when you went into the city. God, what a life-changing day it was. And before this, that week was over, the whole world had been turned upside down. God, I thank you for, for loving us enough, as the, the little boy here this morning said, that Mary had Jesus. He knew that, thank God. Jesus died, thank God. He arose again, thank God. Thank you, Lord, that your plan worked. God, I pray now as we come to worship that, Lord, you would be in the midst, that, God, you would bless now, that the Holy Spirit of God, as we sing that song, let us come into his house to worship him, that, God, that at this time we will get our minds off of other things, and, God, we'd focus on you in that Easter week, God. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, Mimi. At Calvary, hymn number 138. <clears throat> Thank you, Mimi. Thank you, church. At Calvary. At this time, our special music today would be sung by Miss Mandy here. But Mandy, you come and sing for us.
He didn't just carry the cross. Wow, he carried me. What an appropriate song for the, the week that we live in today. All right. Remember, Friday night I will preach you my favorite sermon. You might be wanting to plan to stay a little longer than usual. If I'm going to preach to you my, out of 44 years, I'm going to preach to you my favorite sermon Friday night. No, nah, it won't be too long. But anyway, if you have your Bibles today, I want you to turn me over. This is My throat is about dry as a bone. This is the third message I brought today. And, uh, but it's a very needful message. Every message this morning has been out of the book of John. Sunday school, men's stuff, this, everything. John is, has been uh, the, the go-to guy in the message. But in the 19th chapter of the Gospel of John, you know, this is in most places, in many churches, more so in some others than Baptist churches. Palm Sunday is a really big deal. Some of them celebrate it almost as much as they do Easter. Palm Sunday is big. It shows you how quickly things can change in life. If you remember on Palm Sunday, was the Sunday Jesus had gotten through talking with his disciples, meeting them in an upper room, telling them that he was fixing to leave them, and he goes into the holy city of Jerusalem. He rides in there on a donkey. And everybody there, for the most part, is so glad to see him that they're standing around like a fan club. And they're shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. The Bible says that they were, were laying palm leaves down in front of him to show how special he was as he came in there. That's Palm Sunday, a special day. But in five days, the world turned upside down. In five days, from that Sunday night till that Friday morning, when they hung him on the cross, the world changed. One minute, they're hallelujahing him, they're praising him, they're loving him, and five days later, they nail him to a cross. What changed? What changed? When Jesus was on the cross, he had sayings. Father, into thy hand I commend my spirit. He had several sayings. That a lot of churches will preach on each of those sayings during this, this time of the year. I want to, to focus on one of those sayings this morning. So if you have your Bible, turn with us into the 19th chapter of the Gospel of John. And we want to look at those words when Jesus was hanging on the cross. If you got your Bible or one in front of you, and if you stand with me, please, as we read this together, I want to, this to be special. Verse 26 of John 19 says, That when Jesus therefore saw his mother, and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour that disciple took her into his own house. After this, Jesus knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture could now be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now there was, a set, there was set a vessel full of vinegar, that, feel, that they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon hyssop and put it to his mouth. Last words of Jesus. Jesus there, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. Bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Father, thank you for the cross. Thank you, God, for the shedding of blood for which without it happened there would be no forgiveness of our sins. God, I thank you as Jesus hung on that cross 
I was on his mind. That he died for all of us. When he said it is finished, he meant that what you had sent him here to do was completed. God, we thank you for that love. I thank you, God, as we look forward to next Easter Sunday, the day he arose. But God, let us look today at the day he died. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The last words that Jesus said when he was on the cross was, It is finished. He had had many sayings up to them, but when we think of these things, we think of the fact that in Matthew, before he went to that cross, and he knew what was lying ahead for him, the spike, the pain, the spear, all the things that he would go through for me and you. He went and he prayed. And these were the words he said before he went there that day. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He knew why. He knew that it was necessary. But it's an amazing thing to me. It's not amazing because I've preached there for 44 years, that Jesus had so much pain. He died in trauma. He died an awful, horrible death for you and me so that the purpose of his Father might be completed. Now, we know the story. When Jesus says it is finished in the Bible, that is the word, it is finished, is one word in the Greek. That word is the word to telestai. And when he said to telestai, or it is finished, this is what it means. To bring to an end, to complete, or to accomplish. So when he said to telestai, what he was saying is, I have accomplished everything that my Father sent me here to do. My work is now done. I have done what my purpose was. Now, when they ask, this is the question that probably they should have asked when he said to Telestai, it is finished. The question probably should have been, what is finished? What do you mean it is finished right there? What was finished? Redemption was finished on that cross. Everything that God, and you know what happens, the rest of all the New Testament fills in all the blanks of everything that we ever needed to know about Jesus. Matthew says, and when Jesus had cried again in a loud voice, he gave up the ghost. So I believe this is me. And the pain and the agony and stuff when they were, he was hanging there with those nails in him and he was hanging on that cross with them ripping on his skin and then they stabbed him with a spear. I believe he was in great agony. And he said, it is finished, testelestai, it is then. But the one thing he did not say was, I am finished. He said, it is finished. Not me. Now the soldiers and all those that had hung him on that cross was hoping when they put him in that tomb, that was the last they'd see of him. They were hoping when he said, it is finished, that means he's gone. We don't have to listen to him anymore. We don't have to go after and rest him anymore. Out of sight, out of mind. Oh, but they wrong. Oh, were they so wrong. He did not say, I am finished. He said, it is finished. And I believe he shouted it. Because Matthew said he said it with a loud cry. He hollered out, it is finished. He wanted him to know. And he gave up the ghost. He died right there. So when we see this work, this was a cry of triumph that he 
that he gave that day. I want to read you a verse or two out of Peter concerning this day. It says this in 1 Peter 18. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things, such as silver or gold, that your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without a blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these the last time, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. The only hope is in a risen Savior today. That's the only hope of mankind. So let's just think for just a moment. When Jesus used those words and he said on that cross, it is finished, there were some things that were finished. So let's kind of take a very little quick peek at what was finished on that cross. First thing was finished on that cross was his suffering. The suffering Savior, that was the last time that he would ever suffer like that. His suffering was finished. When we think of Jesus and we talk about Jesus, this is the thing the Bible fills in, and the Bible very plainly tells us that he was born into this world to suffer, didn't he? He knew that when he left heaven, came down to this earth, that it was not going to be an easy journey, it was not going to be an easy go. John 1.10 says, He was in the world, the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He, he came into his own, and his own received him not. Suffering was a necessary part of why Jesus came. Suffering was a necessary reason that he had to come. The Bible says that he came to save his people from their sins. Why? The suffering. He came to die to save them. But what salvation said was this. When he said on that cross, it is finished, and he gave up the ghost. This was what Jesus was saying to the world behind him, the world ahead of him, and the world to come. It's the same message. Salvation is complete. Everything that ever needed to be done for those that came before us, those that will come after us, and us in this world today, everything that God needed to be done for me to go to heaven and to be saved was done when he said, it is finished. Suffering was necessary. You think about Jesus when he walked on this earth. He never owned one thing. Nothing. He didn't have a house to stay in. He didn't have a car to drive. He didn't have a donkey. He needed those things. What did he do? He sent his disciples to get them, didn't he? When he would go into a town, he would have a friend there, and they would let him sleep over in the town because the Bible says that the foxes and animals have a place to lay their head, but the Son of God never even had a place to lay his head, a place that he called home. And he would get up on the morning, he'd start his journey, and he would go wherever, and wherever the nightfall came, he would find some place there sleep he never owned. Even though he owned the whole world, he never really owned one thing during that time that he came as Savior. All the miracles, the preaching, and the teaching, the suffering was finished. When Jesus came and on that cross and died. Forty days later, he would go to heaven to be with the Father. He sits with the Father right now. He's been gone for over 2,000 years. But I'll promise you one thing that has never happened in his life since that day he said he's finished. He's never suffered a pain then again. 
He's in heaven. He's with his Father. What a reunion that had to be when he got back. So his suffering was finished. Secondly, his sacrifice was finished. You remember when I've told you in the book of Hebrews that we've been studying on Sunday morning, we just and we're still in it. I'm moving to another chapter whenever I get back to it. But when we finished up that sixth chapter, we talked about the high priest, remember in the Old Testament, and the priest and all that, and how now Jesus said because he died uh, on the cross that we no longer have to have a high priest, that he is our high priest and we're our own priest and we don't need a priest down here. That's so true. Jesus said, you remember how it was that every year the high priest had to go into the Holy of Holies and and pray for God and put the, the, the blood on, 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 on the, the, the seat there and, and ask God and your, your, your sins were kind of wiped away for a year. Remember that? But next year, we had to go take care of those sins. And the next year, we had to take care of those sins. But when Jesus died on the cross, he said that it's not the the blood of lambs and goats or birds or nothing else, but it is the blood of Jesus now. And it only would happen one time. Jesus didn't have to die every year anymore. Jesus' death on the cross took care of the Old Testament saints, took care of the New Testament saints, took care of all of those that will be born and accept Christ as their Savior that was the last payment that needed to be made, and he made it on that old rugged cross. So his suffering was finished. The sacrifice was finished. You see, in ancient times, when you would buy something, and they would give you a bill of sale like you get sometimes, well, when you paid that bill off, we would probably get a letter from whoever we had borrowed the money from or who we'd paid for it, and it would say what? Paid in full, right? That is exactly what the telestai means, paid in full. So that day, when he died on that cross, it was full, it was paid for, it was done. No more outstanding debts. I don't need another sacrifice. I don't need another priest. I don't need another word other than the word of God. That was done. It was settled. And for me, that's all it takes. I believe in the old rugged cross. I believe that death was necessary. I believe that blood was necessary above all things because without the shedding of his blood on that cross, none of us would go to heaven. None of us. Because without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sin. But he forgave it that day. You see, when they stabbed that spear in him, that's when the blood flowed. That's when the blood flowed. What a great price to pay. And as Mandy sang in her song, he didn't just carry that cross. He carried me. Oh, he carried me. Going to go to heaven one day. And what a day that'll be when my Savior I'll see. That's what the Bible says. And I look into his face, the one that saved me by his grace. What a day, glorious day that's going to be. And it was all because he died that day. He died that day. Forgave us and gave us a way to get there. So not only was his suffering finished, not only will he not have to sacrifice anymore, it was finished. But thirdly, let me tell you what else was finished. Or rather, who else was finished? Satan was finished that day. Satan did not want that to happen. Satan knew, as he used to be a resident of heaven, he knew God. He knew Jesus. He was kicked out. He came down here. 
And for those years that Jesus was down here, they locked horns and they battled. And Jesus won them all. But he knew what God's plan was. That the shedding of blood. So he did not want what to happen to happen, I don't believe. But all the way back to the beginning of the Bible, in the very first book of the Bible, God's Word always comes true. I read it. I hope you read it, study it, because it tells us what's been, it tells us what's here, and it tells us what is to come if we'll look for it. Satan was finished. In the very first book of the Bible, it says that the woman would stomp on the head of the serpent one day. When he yelled, it is finished on that cross. Had stomped on the head of the devil because he knew now the end is coming. He knew now that the first thing he ever heard in the Garden of Eden, what God said, is about to come true. That he is about to be defeated. And he, is, he knows all that, but Satan was doomed and damned whenever he died on that old rugged cross. John 12 and 31 says this, Now is the time for judgment on this world, because now the prince of this world will be driven out. We live in a world today that's bad. We live in a world today that is, I, I say, it's worse than bad. It's awful. It's a sad time because we've taken God and the cross out of everything in the world today, just about. And you take God out of anything, folks, it's doomed. Care what you say, it's doomed. Satan was finished, but he has not quit. He's still alive and well, and I'll be honest with you. He's winning some battles now. But he'll never win the war. One day his head will be stomped. One day he will be cast into a lake of fire. The Bible has already got his funeral plans out. How he'll die, where he'll go when he dies, that's it. So this is the deal. The payment was made. The only question now is, will the payment be accepted? Will it be accepted? That's what I want to to share with you as we close this morning. The Father agreed with the Son that when he died on that cross that day, that every status of the agreement that needed to be made was met that day on the cross. Everything that was needed for man to go to heaven was met on the cross that day. That was done. So when we look at this time, we look at these days that we live in today, Let me just leave you with this thought. Jesus Christ did in six hours what nobody has ever done in the history of the world. In six hours, he accomplished something that no one has ever done or will accomplish ever in the world that we live in in all of eternity. The Bible looks at me, my life, and the righteousness of God, and the Bible says my life is like filthy rags, doesn't it? That's what it says. Now, I don't like that. I'd like to think my life is a little different than that. But that's what God said. He said, but I'm thankful that because of what happened on the cross that day, 
I don't have to pin eternity on my life. I can pin it on him. Because he said that's what he does. The Bible says over in Isaiah 64 and 6, it says all of us have have become like one who is unclean, and all of our righteousness is like filthy rags. And we'll all shrivel up like a leaf and like the wind, and our sins will sweep us away. But if we know the Lord today, I don't pin. I know this. The Bible says the key component to getting into heaven is righteousness. The Bible says, Jimmy, you ain't got that. You just like filthy rags. You you ain't got that righteousness. But the Bible says that what? We go in on the righteousness of who? Jesus Christ. It's kind of like if you go somewhere and it's kind of a private place and you can't get in, but there's somebody that is in there and they drop your name out there at the desk and they say, when he comes, let him in. That's what heaven's like for me. Jesus is going to say, yeah, he was as filthy rags, But when he gets here, you let him in. I paid the cover charge. I paid everything that needed to be paid. So you let him in where I'm at. Folks, that's the only hope you got and the only hope I got is that Jesus says, come on in. Let us in. That he died, he suffered, and all of those things on the cross. Oh, what a Savior. Now, I told you. The other week we had that group singing. Remember when we had the Masters 3 here a few weeks ago? And I went up to them and I said, Do y'all sing, Oh, what a Savior? And guess what? They just happened to have it on their repertoire. They said, We do. Now, I told you this. I told you I was going to preach my favorite sermon Friday night. My favorite song is, Oh, What a Savior. And they sang it that night. Oh, what a Savior. I love it. I love it. I love it. He gave, in that song, it says, He gave His life blood for even me. A little old nobody that most people will never know. But one day I'll walk in the glory, not because I've been your preacher, or not because I'm very good, but I'll walk in the glory one day and Jesus will say, let him in. He's mine. Let him in. He's mine. And we need to think about that. Because the longer we live, the closer the end is coming. And I think in my life, if I can make it to teach you Bible school about what it will be like living in the end times, that's my Bible school stuff. It's going to be terrific. And we can see where we are. I think we're running down a very steep hill here as far as time-wise goes. I think things are changing very rapidly every week. Something happens that takes us further away from God. Every week. Every week. So we started the birth pains of the end of time some time back. And now what I see is what? The birth pains are getting greater now. The church is coming under attack now, as I told you it would. But oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. He gave his life's blood for even me. For me, he left heaven. He carried me up that cower hill, as we just heard. So I want to ask you today as we finish up. He wants to be all of our Savior, doesn't he? I hope today as we close out and 
get ready to go. That you can say, I know Jesus Christ. That you can say, I've asked him to be my Savior. And the fact of the matter is this. If you ask him to be your Savior, and you mean it with your heart, brother, he'll take you over and he'll come in your life and he'll change everything about your life. Preacher, I don't know if I can change. I didn't say you need to change everything about your life. I said he changed everything about your life. Because I'll tell you what, Jesus starts filling up places that's pretty empty in our lives. That's what he does. Oh, what a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. I'll tell you one thing. I'm glad there was a cross. Even though it caused suffering and tremendous pain, God understood that when before the foundation of the world, he made that plan. A lot of people don't want to accept it because in the world we live in today, that's too gruesome. That's too bloody. Remember how I tell you we done, we've done taking the blood out of the church? I would never go to a church that didn't preach the blood. I'm telling you right now, you take the blood out of them hymn box, books, and you tell the preachers in your denomination you can't preach the blood, I'm going out the door. Because I'm going to tell you what, without the blood, you might as well shut that door right there. And yet we, they say this gory, and, and the people coming up, they don't like to know that blood is, does that. Blood seems like something bad. No, no, no. The shedding of blood at that time was the greatest thing that ever happened to mankind. What I tell you, he did more than six days than the whole everybody in the world has ever done. That's my Jesus. That's our Savior. So as we have our hymn of invitation today, we're coming into a day and a time where you're going to have to make some choices about which direction your life's going to go. Not only that, but when you leave this world, what direction your life is going into? There's two directions, up and down. That's the only two ways to go. There ain't no sideways. You're either going up to heaven or you're going down to hell. That's it. That's the only, isn't it amazing? That's the only options. You know, what we'd like to say, it, you know when somebody's an alcoholic, you know what they do with them? If they got the money, and find them. they send them to a halfway house somewhere or, or three rivers or, or somewhere like that to leave them there for a little while see if they can get their act together. God don't give us that option. You either got it or you ain't got it. You either know me or don't. When the time comes, you can't say, Lord, well, let me go over here and Stay a little while in this church place and try to get my life straightened out. Uh -uh. When judgment day comes, it's judgment day. There's no reprieve. And the only pardon is to those that know Jesus Christ as their Savior. Well, preacher, how do I get to know him? I'm amazed how simple God made it. That cross I preached about took care of everything you owe. You can go to heaven without except. There's only one thing you got to do to get there. One thing. And it's amazing that most people are not going there. Most people are not going to heaven. They're not. Because they miss one thing. Just asking God to forgive you of your sins. Meaning it with your heart. He said, if you'll do that, I'll cover you. Repent. John the Baptist preached all them years and they hated his gut. They put him in jail. Why? Because he had one message. No matter when you went to John preach, if you went down to the River Jordan where John was preaching, he had the same message every time. Repent. Repent. For the kingdom of God is coming. He never changed his message. Well, the message is still the same today. Unless a man repent of his sins, he shall not see the kingdom of God. I'm going to ask you today, just, I love you, God loves you. He, hey, he did this for me and you, like, like 
Mandy sang. He carried you on that cross when we went there. And the only thing you got to do is say, Lord, here I am. I believe you died for me. You know, when I take, I'll take young people sometime or, or people I'm counseling about salvation, they'll come and talk to me after church in my office or something. And this, and, and this is what I'll say. I remember talking to Parker about this. I said, do you believe Jesus died for you? Do you believe that when he died on that cross, that that means he'll forgive you of all sins? Do you believe that? And what did you say? I do. That's right. Folks, wow. Can you say, I do? If you can't, then you come and say, Preacher, I'm not, I don't, you don't need to understand it. I've been saved for 50 years, and I still don't understand it. I really don't. But I believe it. I believe it. Because I believe what that book says. And if you come and say, Preacher, just pray with me. I may not understand all, but I do know this. That I want to go to heaven, and I want you to tell me and help me be sure I'm on the right road. We have this hymn of invitation. It is finished. Would you stand and say, if God's speaking to you, you come. Now, this is why I'm here. Mimi Lewis. I'm at 309. God's saying to you, go talk to that preacher. I ain't going to bite you. I'm going to love you. You come. And let's be sure when we leave here that we know, that we know, that we know where we're going. You know that. do this one work. I really believe that there's somebody in here that needs to come. I don't know why. But I remember something Billy Graham said many years ago. Billy Graham said the greatest mission field in the world is in our church pews. Is in our church pews. Because I was one of them that came to church all the time. But I never had that relationship until later on in my life. It's easy to come to church and say, well, I go to that church, I'm there. That's not a big deal with God. Have you asked him to save you? Have you asked him to come in your life? I did that, and it was life-changing. It was hard for me to do, to get out and walk down the church aisle with a church full of people that knew me from whenever and say, I want the Lord, when they thought I had the Lord. My, what a day. I'll never forget that day. I'll never forget that preacher. I'll never forget that sermon that day. Would you come today? I believe God's giving us a special chance right here. You may, when the Bible says it, I mean, not the Bible, but there's a song that says, when he was on the cross, I was on his mind. Let me tell you something. You were on his mind. You were. And you're on his mind today. And he's saying, just come on. Would you come as we sing one more verse, please?
thank you so much for being here. Come back with us tonight at 6 o'clock. I'm going to preach to you about the danger of letting your guard down. He warns us in the Bible about letting our guard down. And I'm going to preach about that tonight to try to help us to look at things, what's going on, and don't let our guard down. Because Satan's still alive and Satan's still well today in the world we live in. Reverend Gardner, Brother Lynn, would you dismiss us with prayer this morning?